Personal notice changes my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you've got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Standard Oil Company of California invites you to Let George Do It. In a moment, we'll begin tonight's adventure of George Valentine. But first, check the special protection your engine gets from heavy-duty RPM motor oil. As you know, stop-and-go driving is the toughest test an engine gets. Yet a taxicab company, operating in the day-in, day-out grind of traffic, found heavy-duty RPM motor oil actually reduced engine wear 71%. More than doubled engine life, the time between major overhauls due to lubrication. So for top protection for your engine, get heavy-duty RPM motor oil at any independent Chevron gas station or standard station where they say and mean we take better care of your car. The Mystic, a transcribed adventure of George Valentine. Dear Mr. Valentine, I'm worried about my aunt. Perhaps you know her. This is John Breckenridge of River Park Drive. She's under the influence of a man whom I consider dangerous. He's known as Calma the Mystic. May I call to discuss my problem? I cannot give you the full details you asked for in the letter, so will you please see me? I will telephone later for an appointment. Very sincerely, yours, Rita Morton. Calma the Mystic. Miss Morton called early this morning, and I made an appointment for 10 o'clock. Yeah. You know, these mystics interest me. When I was a boy, I never missed them when they came to our yeah. theater. The young lady seems to be ahead of time. Yeah, come in. George Valentine? Yeah. I want you to leave my cousin alone. Well, now, take it easy, Buster. I don't know you, and I don't know your cousin. Don't lie to me, Valentine. I heard her making an appointment with you at 10 this morning. Oh, is your cousin Rita Morton? Yes, I'm Thad Breckenridge. Any relation to Mrs. John Breckenridge? She's my aunt. My cousin Rita want to see you about her? Well, if you're interested, why don't you stick around and find out? Listen, Valentine. Whatever she's offering you, I'll give you a double to keep out of this. I guess that must be Miss Morton. Look, I don't want her to know I've been here. That other door lead back to the hall? No, to my private office. The office has a door to the hall. Now, look, look. Thanks, Miss. I'll use it. I'll see you later, Valentine. Hold on, Buster. Hello, George. You're going to tell her about it? Let's see what she wants first. Come in. Mr. Valentine? That's right. I'm George Valentine. Miss Morton? Yes, yes. I had an appointment at 10. If you're busy, That's all right. This is my assistant and right arm, Miss Brooks. How do you do? Sit down, won't you? Your letter said that you were worried about your aunt. Yes, Mr. Valentine. Do you know her? Only by reputation. A very wealthy woman, I believe. Very. And very eccentric. Why, she won't make a move until she consults her husband. Oh, no. I'd call that sensible. Well, her husband's been dead for five years. Oh, I see. And that makes her easy prey for fortune tellers and mystics. Like this fellow, uh, what's his name? Uh, Calma. I suppose he pretends to get messages from the late Mr. Breckenridge. Yes, and she believes them. Why, she never makes a move without his advice. Oh, what sort of advice? Oh, everything. Investments, doctors. Now it's a will. You mean this baker's telling her what to do with her money? Yes, Miss Brooks. It isn't that I want her to name me in a will. I haven't known her long enough. Well, now, what do you mean by that? Well, I've only been living with her for a few months. I was working in an orphanage in Salem, Massachusetts. I'd been left there when my mother died. Mother was Aunt Emma's sister, and, well, when Aunt Emma heard where I was, she sent for me. I love my aunt very much, and I don't want to see her cheated. Naturally. But what do you think I can do? Mrs. Breckenridge must have a lawyer. She has, John Chadwick. He said he'd refuse to make out any will that Calma might suggest. Even Martha's talked with Aunt Emma. Martha? Another relative? Well, Martha's been my aunt's companion ever since her husband died. Oh, we've all talked to her. Martha, Thad, and I. Thad? My cousin. Well, that, that is, we call each other cousins. He's actually Uncle John's nephew. Well, I'm Aunt Emma's niece. I see. Related only by marriage. Yes, that's right. We, we've all begged Aunt Emma not to listen to Calma. We told her that it isn't possible that he can speak with Uncle John. But she just won't listen to us. Well, now, if she won't listen to her relatives, uh, her companion, or her lawyer, what makes you think she'd listen to a stranger like me? Well, I thought perhaps that you could show her what a fake Calma is. Why, 
I can't just barge in on the good lady and say, this Kalma you think so much of is a charlatan. Well, tonight Kalma's holding a seance at my aunt's. I can arrange for you to be there. George, I've never been to a seance. Aunt Emma told us that tonight Kalma will prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that he's in communication with Uncle John. Oh, brother, this I'd love to see. Aunt Emma told me that I might bring a friend of mine to the seance. I want you to be there. Then you'll be able to judge for yourself if he's cheating her. Well, I can tell you right now he's cheating her. But Brooksy and I'd love to be present and see how he does it. Oh, thank you, Mr. Valentine. I'll expect you both about eight. Oh, Aunt Emma, these are my friends. Mr. Valentine and Miss Brooks. How do you do? Oh. I trust you're not scoffers. Oh, we promise to behave ourselves, Mrs. Breckenridge. You call us seekers rather than scoffers, Mrs. Breckenridge. Oh, and this is my cousin, Thad. How do you do? And this is Mrs. Hadley. Martha. Well, thank goodness you're here, Mr. Valentine. We need people with sense. Well, what are we to expect? Manifestations? Apparitions? Well, if so, I want to sit close. I'm rather nearsighted. Nothing like that. Calman tells me that he used to ask the spirits to appear, but never any more. Now he hears voices. Uh-huh. I suppose he's waiting to make an entrance. Calma's in the silence, alone with his soul. Oh, same old stuff, Brooksy. Wouldn't you think they'd try something new? He's coming. Good evening, my friends. Are we all here? Yes, Calma. This is my niece, Rita. Please. I would rather you did not introduce anyone to me. I would prefer to think of you all as I think of myself, a medium through whom the spirits may communicate. Would you like me to turn out the lights, Professor? That will be unnecessary, sir. Darkness is essential only to the uninitiated. Will you all be seated? Uh, any special place? Oh, wherever you will, Mrs. Breckenridge. Oh. Well, uh, take this chair beside me, Mr. Valentine. Right, and Miss you. Brooks on the other side of you. Right. And Rita, yeah, you and Chad take the sofa. And Martha over there in the big chair. My friends, there are seven of us. And the number seven is very helpful to the proper atmosphere. Same old approach, Will you don't please you? keep quiet? I must ask you to be as quiet as you can and to concentrate. I am very conscious of distracting sounds. And now, Mrs. Breckenridge, will you tell your friends what you have asked me to do as a supreme test? I have asked Kalma to tell me what my husband wrote to me on our 10th anniversary. Oh, pardon? You mean you would like your husband to tell me what he wrote? Oh, brother, George. how could you? There is a disturbing influence here. I'm sorry I spoke, Mr. Carter. No, 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 dear lady, it is not you. I guess I'm the one the professor means. Can't you do your little act while I'm here? Mr. Valentine, please. Rita, who is this friend of yours? I can answer that, Mrs. Breckenridge. Mr. Valentine is a private detective and a disbeliever in the occult. He would be happy to see me fail. Now, don't get me wrong. Mr. I'm... Valentine, if this is true, I must ask you to leave. Oh, dear lady, no. That would be playing into his hands. That would brand me as a charlotte and a trickster. If I cannot give you the answer you seek with Mr. Valentine here, the proof would be worthless. You're mighty sure of yourself, Buster. Mr. Valentine, if Kalma can do what I ask, I'm sure that even you would have to admit that he's able to communicate with those beyond. But the mere reading of a message It is more than that. On our 10th anniversary, just a month before he left me, my husband wrote me a message. No one ever saw it but John and me. It has been in our safe. The little one in my bedroom wall where I keep all my valuables. And I believe you said, dear lady, that only you know the combination of this safe. That is true. Mr. Valentine, if Kalma can tell me what is written in the message, won't you be satisfied? Possibly not, Mrs. Breckenridge, but I'd be impressed. Because if the test is as rigid as you've outlined, I don't think it can be done. Oh, <laughs> The gentleman's doubts will make success all the sweeter. Go ahead, Buster, go ahead. It's your show. I dislike the word show, Mr. Valentine. Rather, let us say test. Mrs. Breckenridge, you have asked me what your husband wrote to you. I hope he will tell me. Now, my friends, I do not ask you to believe me. I only request that you will favor me with quiet. I wish to be allowed to listen to the voice of the beyond which cannot be heard over the din of the present. Oh, brother, a new slicing of the old balloon. Ouch! Hey, cut it out, you? He asked for quiet. The silence surrounds me. The voices of the mortal world are fading. John Breckenridge, if you can hear, speak to me. 
Tell me the words that we are anxious to hear. Tell me what you wrote. Help me convince these kind people that the riddle of the universe is not unanswerable. Wait. I hear you faintly. Come nearer, John Breckenridge. Yes. Yes. It is written in verse... Oh, that's right, that's right. There are four lines. The first letters that begin each line spell out something. The name... Emma. John. E-M-M-A. E, each happy year that you have been my wife. M, my dearest love, you have been the world to me. M, may we have many days in this short life. A, and stay together in the world to be. John, John. The voice fades. The mortal world returns. Ah. Did I say anything? You sure did, brother. John, my husband. Quick, get some water. Mrs. Breckenridge has fainted. In just a moment, we'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Right now, let's talk a minute about gasoline. When you come right down to it, there's really only one selling point for gasoline, and that's performance. All gas looks much the same. The one big difference is the way it performs in your car. That's why it's so important for you to know this fact. Any gasoline can be made to stress a single performance feature. But Chevron Supreme gives you all eight high-performance qualities in correct balance. Quick starting, fast warm-up, anti-knock, vapor lock prevention, area blending, smooth acceleration, economy mileage, and full power. They're all yours in every gallon of Chevron Supreme. So if habit has you buying a one-feature gas that's robbing you of real driving pleasure, better switch over now to the gas with all eight Chevron Supreme. Remember, the one big difference in gasoline is the way it performs in your car. And Chevron Supreme has all eight high-performance qualities. Drive in soon and fill her up with Chevron Supreme gasoline at any standard station or independent Chevron gas station where they say, and mean, we take better care of your car. <laughs> You are asked to attend a seance by Rita Morton, niece of the wealthy Mrs. John Breckenridge. Rita tells you that her aunt is under the influence of a mystic who calls himself Kalma and wants you to investigate. The mystic presents a seemingly impossible manifestation, but if your name is George Valentine, you aren't satisfied. So next day, you decide to call at the Breckenridge home. Hello, Rita. Oh, Mr. Valentine, Miss Brooks. Come in, please. Thank you. Have you found out anything? No, I'm afraid not. We haven't very much information, you know. Would you mind if I ask you a few questions? Oh, no, of course not. Come in the library. I suppose you'd like to talk to my aunt. Yes, your aunt, Thad, and Martha. Well, they're all out now. I'm the only one here. Well, sit down, won't you? Okay. Well, thank you. Now, tell me, Rita, did I understand you to say that Mrs. Hadley found you in an orphanage in Salem, Massachusetts? The Peabody Orphanage. Yes, that's right. Uh-huh. Have you any idea how she found you there? Well, I'm afraid you'll have to ask her that yourself. Ask me what? Oh, Martha, I didn't hear you come in. You remember Miss Brooks and Mr. Valentine? Of course. Oh, well. <laughs> I didn't see who it was without my glasses. Mr. Valentine was asking me some questions about how you found me at the orphanage. Yes, that's right, Mrs. Hadley. How did you know Rita was there? Well, I'd always known where she was. Martha was a friend of my mother's. Oh, I see. It's no secret, Mr. Valentine. I'd known Rita's mother for a good many years. The sisters became estranged when Marguerite married against her family's wishes. Mother married an actor. She wanted to go on the stage. Oh, now, I don't think that would interest Mr. Valentine. Oh, no, on the contrary. Everything about Rita interests me. Mrs. Hadley, how did you persuade Mrs. Breckenridge to invite Rita here? Well, I didn't have anything to do with it. Mrs. Breckenridge was always having her fortune told, going to mediums and clairvoyants. Someone told her she'd be unlucky if she didn't do something for her sister's child. And you told her you knew where Rita was? That's right. Uh -huh. 
Do you remember who the medium was who advised Mrs. Breckenridge? Well, there were so many of them, I don't recall. You said you were a friend of Rita's mother. How did you and Mrs. Breckenridge meet? Well, when Rita's mother died, I brought Mrs. Breckenridge some of her sister's things. We saw quite a bit of each other, and we struck up a friendship. Now, one more question. What type of acting did Rita's mother do? Well, she was in vaudeville, Mr. Valentine. I found some old programs in the library. Aunt Emmett kept them. Mother was in an act called Raja and Rita. I was named after Mother, you know. What kind of an act was it? Well, I don't know. The program just said Roger and Rita. Have you the program handy? Yes, yes, it's in the scrapbook. It's in one of the desk drawers. I'll get it. Good, good, thank you. Well, what difference does it make what Rita's mother did? Oh, just interesting to know her background, that's all. I was looking at this only the other day. Oh, here it is. Thanks. Roger and Rita, it sounds oriental. What was the act, Mrs. Hadley? Do you remember? Why, I think it was a juggling or a tumbling act. You can see they came on next to closing. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Interesting, Bill. Harrison's dogs, sure shot Maddie, Victor and Clark, the great Frandini. <laughs> I, I can't see what difference it makes that Rita's mother was a performer. Were you ever on the stage, Mrs. Hadley? Oh, heavens no. Whatever makes you ask that? Well, I'm just curious, that's all. Well, if you ladies can't give me any more information, we'll we'll get going. If I find out anything about Kalma, I'll let you know. Oh, thank you. It certainly is a beautiful place you have here. Those wonderful old trees. Mrs. Breckenridge is very proud of her ground. I should think you'd get lonely way out here in the woods. <laughs> How far away are your uh, nearest neighbors? About a mile, I'd say. Uh-huh. Well, goodbye again. Bye. Bye. George, what were you trying to find out? You heard my questions. I heard them, but sometimes I don't understand why you're asking me. Well, you two are here again. Oh, hello, Thad. Rita won't need you anymore, Valentine. The will business is settled. Calma talked to my aunt this morning and advised her not to change her present will. And I'll bet that leaves everything to you. In our client's interest, could we know the terms of the will? I see no harm in telling you. This house and money were my uncle's. So outside of a few small legacies, I get the bulk of the estate. But uh, you needn't worry about Rita. If anything happens to me, she'll get everything. If nothing happens to me, we'll share it anyway. You see, Valentine, I love Rita. I want to marry her. If she'll have me, it won't make any difference who gets the money. Valentine! You're here! Valentine, I'll I'll get an answer. No, no time. Brooksy will drive me. Let me help you. No one has a right to hunt these No, Now, get me. There is hospital. A fine thing scaring me half to death. If you weren't hurt, why did you fall down? Well, you don't think I wanted them to keep shooting at me? I thought you'd been killed. Well, I, I'm sorry, Angel. I thought whoever did it would feel more secure if they thought they winked. No. What do you think it could have been? Uh, Martha, Rita herself. Either one had time to get out of the back door and hide among the trees. Possibly it was someone from outside. I don't know. Maybe it was just a hunter like Thad said. Well, if it was, I'll bet it was open season for either Thad or me. But why, well, George? maybe why? someone thinks I'm asking too many questions. Now, look, Brooksy, I have a call to make on an old friend of mine who runs a theatrical agency downtown. Now, while I'm there, will you send a wire to the Peabody Orphanage at Salem, Massachusetts? Ask him to let you know all about Rita Morton. How she came there, when she left, everything possible. Well, well, George Valentine. Long time no see. What brings you here, honey? Well, Flory, you know more about vaudeville than anyone I know. I need your help. We want to buy some good acts. I got them by the dozen. Say, tell me, did you ever hear of a juggling act called Raja and Rita? Raja and Rita was a mind-reading act. Are you sure? I knew all the mind-reading acts, honey. The Zanzigs, the Fays, the Great Tremaine. Well, someone told me they were jugglers. I played with them many times. They were headliners. Used to share the building with a great friend, Dini. Oh, yes, I remember that name. Well, what did he do? Well, he was an escape artist. But he worked for the Raja on the side. I don't understand. He was understage man. Rita sat on the stage, dressed in oriental clothes. Raja went through the audience, got the folks to write their questions. Then he'd pretend to burn them in a big fishbowl. Oh, Actually, he'd passed them the Pearly Gates under the stage. That was a great Frandini's real name, Pearly Gates. I see. Pearly'd read the questions off to Rita through the earphones she wore. Did you say earphones? Yeah, that's right, honey. 
She had them under her turban. Oh, boy, did they amaze the yokels. Yeah, well, that sounds like a good act. Could I engage them? No, I'm afraid not, George. You read as dead. I was on the same bill with them when it happened. Oh, I'll never forget it. I took eight bows that night. I could hoof in those days, honey. Nice girl, Rita. She and Roger had a little baby, two years old. Oh, Roger took on awful. He had to put the baby in the home. Well, where is he now? I don't know. He got another partner. Girl used to be a sharpshooter. Not an Annie Oakley, but good till her eyes went bad. Nope, she wasn't the performer Rita was. So the act folded, and Pearlie was the only one who went on. Pearlie, you mean the great Frandini? Yeah, yeah. Pearlie was a good performer in his own right. He only helped Roger out because they were such good friends. No, Pearlie wasn't no Houdini, of course. But he certainly could get out of handcuffs and open locks. Why, sometimes he'd pick pockets in the audience. He never took money, of course, but he'd read people's cards and licenses and notebooks and pass on the information to Rita. Well, uh, maybe I could locate Frandini. He, he might just fit into the bill I have in mind. Oh, honey, I haven't seen Pearlie in years. I'll see what I can do for you, though. Good, good. Thanks, Florrie. You've been a great help. See you around. <laughs> you find out anything, George? Yeah, plenty. Flory was a perfect mine of information. Any reply from Salem? Yes. It says, Rita Morton, left in hospital March 10th, 1934, by father and stepmother, Harry and Maddie Morton, known in vaudeville as Raja and Rita. Uh -huh. Rita left home September 6th, 1951, with stepmother this minute. George Valentine's office, Claire Brooks speaking. Miss Brooks, this is Tad Breckenridge. Oh, yes, Mr. Breckenridge. Tell Tad I'm not expected to pull through. How's Valentine? Oh, he's very low. I'm sorry. I wanted to apologize to him for the way I talked. Rita explained things to me. I wanted to tell him, too, there'll be another seance tonight at 9 o'clock. If you can get There's here... There's going to be another seance tonight. Well, he tell won't. him you'll be there. I won't. Uh, George won't be able to make it, of course. I'll come, unless he needs me. We'll expect you. Sorry to hear about Valentine. Bye. Uh, goodbye. He's sorry you won't be there. Oh, I'll be there. But I'll go in the back way. I have enough information now to make the spirits talk their heads off. I have asked you all to come here because we were so successful at our last meeting. A sympathetic aura surrounds us. Miss Brooks, I'm glad to welcome you, but I'm sorry about Mr. Valentine. How is he? Haven't your voices told you? You must not jest about the supernatural, my dear lady. I'm not jesting. I'm just asking. I know you hear many things we don't. May I ask you something? Of course. Did you ever see spirits as well as hear them? You may not believe me, but I have. When the atmosphere is right, when there is the proper silence and... <laughs> Who did that? Who, did that? Who put out the light? Alma, do you hear me? Who is that? Lights. The lights will not go on until I have spoken with you. John Breckenridge? No. This is one who has only recently joined your band of spirits. I have messages for you all. Mrs. Breckenridge... Do you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Don't change your will. What? That's why you called them all back tonight, wasn't it, Kalma? John Breckenridge was going to tell his wife to divide the money. Half to Rita and half to Thad. Half a loaf is better than none and safer than asking for all. You decided that when the shot didn't kill Thad. What did you say? It was meant for you, Thad. If it had hit you, there would have been no need for tonight's seance. Isn't that right, Martha? Then the money could have gone to Rita... And eventually to you and Kalma. Who are you? Your victim, Martha. Too bad your aim isn't as good as it was in the old days, before you had to wear glasses. But when your eyes get used to the dark, they'll be able to see me. I see something. I see his face. There's a wound on his head. George! Valentine! Someone turn on the light. That's right, Kalma. Valentine. Come back to haunt you. The dead don't come back. I'm here to reveal a secret more wonderful than John Breckenridge's message. Raja and Rita. Not jugglers, Martha, but mind readers. Rita died, and a place was taken by another Rita, who was formerly known as Matty the Shore Shock. Karma, he knows. Stop it. Rita and Raja had a daughter, little Rita. When Matty joined Raja, the little girl was put into an orphanage in Salem. It was easy to find her when Emma Breckenridge asked about her sister's child, wasn't it, Martha? You had it all worked out. Martha, is this true? Did you bring an imposter into my oh, home? Oh, she's your own niece, Mrs. Breckenridge. Your sister Rita's child. Poor Rita. The black sheep of the family. 
The girl who ran away from home to be an actress and ended by being a fake mind reader. Now, what has this to do with me? Little Rita's father and the woman who had taken her mother's place in the act decided to get hold of some of the aunt's money. They knew the aunt believed in spirits. Shall I go on from there? No, I believe you. Rita, you've tricked me. Coming into my home. Rita didn't know. She wasn't a party to the plan. It was all Martha, alias Matty, and Pearlie, the man who could open locks. And Raja, or as you know him, Kalma. Kalma? My father? Oh, no. Oh, quick, hold him, Thad. Brooksy, keep an eye on Martha. I'll turn on the lights. Mr. Valentine, you're alive. How did you find all this out? Find the information, some guesswork, and a little luck. Wait till I get this makeup off, and I'll tell you. Just one of the many extras you get from your car savers is a sparkling windshield service. Nothing can spoil a pleasure drive like the kind of eye strain caused by a grimy windshield. Car savers use plenty of elbow grease and really get them clean. You're welcome anytime, so stop in soon for sparkling windshield service. It's just one of the many reasons why the car savers at independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations say and mean... We take better care of your car. I'm deeply indebted to you, Mr. Valentine. All in a day's work, Mrs. Breckenridge. I don't see how you knew it was Mrs. Hadley who shot at you. Well, it couldn't have been Thad. He was with us. The odds were against Mrs. Breckenridge and Rita. I already suspected Martha Hadley. Why? Well, I had a hunch that she'd been in vaudeville herself. You know, most people call a man or a woman from the stage an actor or actress. But people from vaudeville usually say performer. She also used the expression, next to closing. Then, when I found out she'd lied by telling me Rita and Raja were jugglers, I knew I was on the right track. And I remember there'd been an act on the bill called Sure Shot Matty. Flory's information clinched it. Oh, you really frightened me, Mr. Valentine, when you appeared in that half-light with that white face and the wound on your forehead. You frightened me, too, George, even though I expected to see you. I'll see that you get a handsome check. I owe you a lot for showing up that charlatan. Thank you, Mrs. Breckenridge. I hope to see you again. Perhaps sometime you'll show me how these mediums do some of their other tricks. I'd be happy to. And you can do something else for me. Yes, Mr. Valentine. Well, try and make it easy for Rita. She feels badly enough about Kalma being her father. I will, Mr. Valentine. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Oh, that was nice of you to think of Rita, George. Oh. After all, she was our client. I guess that will help her forget. You know they invited us to their wedding. Ah, uh, you can go. I don't like weddings. Well, there's one wedding I hope I can get you to. Yeah? Who's? Ask the spirits, darling. They'll tell you. <laughs> Tonight's transcribed adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard Oil Company of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West. Robert Bailey has starred as George with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. Let George Do It was written by Davis Kent and directed by Kenneth Webb. Larry Dobkin was heard as Kalma, Virginia Eiler as Rita, Frank Hale as Martha, Tom McKee as Thad, and Ruth Parrott as Emma. The music was composed and presented by George Wright. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. Let George Do It is heard overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System.